All right, so I finished reading Saboti, and there's a lot of feelings right now. Let's uh, let's say that I didn't get a lot of my predictions right on this one. But also, not all of my feelings were purely bad. For example, we got to see the red line along with all the weirdness that it comes with. In the manga, it's like raining candy, which like... Yeah, sure. And we also get like snake ocean waves. The new world is gonna have some pretty weird stuff. That being said, I was really excited to go to Fishman Island. I've realized that a strong story decision of One Piece is that with the nature of the Grand Line, if we showcase an island, we know that eventually, due to the nature of the Grand Line, we can just go to that island. So we're able to throw ideas way into the future. We can throw something out like Elbaf, the land of giants and then due to the linear structure of the grand line we might be able to get there eventually so the fact that we've known about fishman island since chapter 60 means that we can continually keep expanding on it do you know what nobody mentioned though how do you get there because it turns out that fishman island is at the bottom of the ocean and you can't just go straight down there so again narratively we reuse the compass which well done making that its own story in skypea if it can point upwards it hints that it could also point downwards so fishman island is essentially just sky Pia 2.0. Seriously, this arc got me to really appreciate how we we're able to like weave together a lot of the story threads with world building. Like these cover stories are starting to become a flex, all right? The fact that they're relevant with Hatchin's story showcasing Kami and the whole Fishman slavery thing 200 chapters before the start of Sabote? Because now we know what we're in for when Kami says that somebody has captured Hachin. We're talking about Fishman slavery right there. And honestly, I was kind of conflicted on this one, as were a lot of the Straw Hats when everyone figured out who Hachin was. Because, I mean, when you think about it, these are some pretty deep wounds that you have left on Nami's past. Like, she didn't just have to deal with the Fishman Pirates for a year. She had to deal with it for her entire childhood. And it's one of those kind of situations where I think no matter how hard you try to redeem a character, you could only go so far. I think Hachin knows this, and it's interesting to see the way he acts with Nami and the way Nami acts with the, I'll help you and I'll be friendly around you, but we know that you were that, okay? I think it's overall a situation where it's probably better to save Hachin, even if you don't like him, because uh, the whole slavery thing, which is where we run into this person seemingly out for revenge. For the longest time, I was trying to figure out who could this uh, shady person be? Could it be Craig? We haven't seen him in a long time. He certainly has armor for it. Maybe he went back to the Grand Line. Most other pirates did. Nope, instead it is the, the dumbest joke of the series so far. With the introduction of a living Sanji wanted poster. You got me, alright? I spent like an hour trying to plot out who it could be, and I wanted to seem really smart about it, and no! You can't predict that. And even though, um, I don't, I don't remember what their name is. I'm going to call them like bootleg Sanji. And even though bootleg Sanji is a pretty questionable person, he has a lot of his moments here. We get the introduction of the flying fish conceptually. Very cool world building. I thought they were robots. They're fish. Wait, I should clarify. In the manga, it looks like they're just flying. So I thought they were like robots or something and not actual fish. Okay. We got, we got bootleg Sanji immediately having a huge self-esteem with his new face. We got Luffy using hockey for the first time to take down bootleg Sanji's buffalo. And we got to see Thousand Sunny's abilities. But look, I already love the Thousand Sunny's mini Marys, all right? I thought it was like such a cute homage to their previous ship. So to see the new abilities like the ship shooting a laser beam and destroying practically an entire town, making it like the Straw Hats' version of uh, something like the Buggy Ball is pretty cool. All right, on the list of predictions that I got totally incorrect, I thought that Luffy was gonna go for Ace. The Straw, Hat, the Straw Hats didn't go for Ace. That was kind of a left turn, but Luffy does justify it in a pretty strong way. That along with like Ace's self-esteem, making him more of like a lone wolf character, he wouldn't want to be rescued really. I mean, he actually left to go hunt Blackbeard without backup and lost now that I think about it. Because later we find out that he's about to be publicly executed. I think if Luffy knew that, things would probably go down differently. Though considering what is about to happen in Saboti, it's probably the best that he didn't go there. 
if I understand correctly, Blackbeard one captured Ace. He is turning in Ace to become a warlord of the sea. The government is going to publicly execute Ace in Impel Down. And almost everybody is there because it is likely to provoke Whitebeard and maybe Shanks to come over there. Which, I mean, narratively, that's way stronger than what I predicted. I just predicted that, like, Blackbeard would get captured and, like, I don't know, fight on Whitebeard's ship or something. <laughs> but instead, we see that some pretty serious stuff is about to go down. I wonder where Luffy plays into this equation. Because maybe you could add Luffy prior to this arc and he could have, like, immediately gone over there, just beeline to Tace and try to save him. But after this arc, Luffy is going to have a whole ton of problems of his own. Okay, so also weird questionable thing. Ace is still alive right now, but his card is going out. Can the card predict when Ace is going to die? Or is it just how alive he is? Is he getting like tortured or killed right now? Um, okay. I'm realizing that the whole review is probably going to be a huge appreciation of the structure of the Grand Line because in order to get to the New World, you have to either go through the Red Line past Marijua, Marijua? Marijua, and the world government. So that's not happening. Or somehow go under towards Fishman Island. Apparently a common strategy is just to ditch your boat and go through the red line and then get a new boat, which I find hilarious because the Straw Hats are not going to do that. Imagine if we had just spent all of this time mourning over the loss of the Going Merry, then spending all of this time acquiring a new ship which we have just poured our hopes and dreams into, only to then ditch the Thousand Sunny after like two islands. Of course we're going to go to Sabodi. Sabodi feels like a land of contradiction. It's a mixture between like a Disneyland attraction and Mock Town from Jaya. And I hope you stick with me for a little bit of repetition. On the one hand, Sabodi loves gift shops and they sell you strange objects like bubble bikes. But on the other hand, it's a total scam and they're aware that you're gullible enough to buy it. On the one hand, sure, there are technically laws, I guess, in the sense that Marijua is right around the corner. On the other hand, half of this place is actually lawless and practically everything's off the table. On the one hand, you have the Grand Line, which is a difficult adventure which countless people have died trying to even enter. And on the opposite side, have this Grand Line cookie, which you can take back to your hometown. Right? On the one hand, you have fun theme park attractions. Ha ha ha, get distracted. And on the other hand, you have actual slavery and slave auctions where the government will do nothing. Well, that's not necessarily true. The government isn't just fine with this. It's encouraging, even. In fact, it's owned by one of the seven warlords of the sea. This is Sabodi, and these contradictions say so much about this location, as well as the people in it, as well as the government itself. Because sure, there were some hints that the government was more of a self-interested party that technically helped people. But here... Now, it's very apparent with the world nobles. I mean, look at this guy. Just stare at this guy. We have gone from, like, maybe subtly hinting that the world government is maybe bad, kind of, maybe, to a full-on caricature of a bad, dumb, powerful person. The subtlety is off for this one. So, when we first got into the Grand Line, I was kind of disappointed that we would only follow one path, even though this path has been over a thousand chapters long. I felt like a kid who had been given a handful of candy and saw a jar that had so much more candy and I wanted that candy too. <laughs> I just want more of this world. But when I saw the um, 11, I think, rookies, there were a lot of them, uh, I realized just how good of an idea it was to not be able to see every route of the Grand Line. We have seen the adventures that the Straw Hats have gone on. We have seen just how tough some of the scenarios we have gotten ourselves into. How many times everyone has gotten close to death. And what we're being shown here by having all of these other rookies come to Sabodi is that we're being shown that everyone here 
here had to work just as hard as the Straw Hats in order to reach Sabote. And there is an immediate respect to that, as well as having half of them not just have a high bounty, but also having a very high status with multiple up and comers of this like new generation of pirates, with people placing their bets on the pirates who they think are going to become big achievers. The introductions were just amazing. It was like we were just introduced to one character after another character after another character. I just really hope we get to see more of them. Like, I know we'll probably see Ace and Kid. We have a pretty good trio going on there. But I mean, come on. We got a dinosaur and Mafia and the band kid and also a person from the White Sea. And I mean, I just want more. But no, I had just said I had a handful of candy not to go after the entire jar. My bad. Also, one of the things that we see from seeing all of these characters is that we picked like the most PG characters to follow. Everyone else could not blend in. Maybe Bonnie, maybe Law, but that's it. The Straw Hats are pirates, but they're like good pirates. Some of the bad pirates have high bounties, straight up just attack people. Everyone else in the 11 rookies does not appear to be a good pirate. Maybe Bonnie, but I don't know. It's, she saves Oro. I like Bonnie. Good job. All right, in order to enter Fishman Island, we need someone to coat the boat in some sort of material. And I love that as the crew is trying to figure out who is going to be the person who does that job, we run into an ex-pirate who tells us that the person who could probably coat the boat is also an ex-pirate who was the right-hand man of Gold Rogers. And it's just really cool to see so many pirates in Sabote. Of course, when you throw something out there and say you used to be an ex-pirate, there's a ton of questions that you want to ask, especially when you're talking to people who know about the Void Sentry and about Podiglyphs and about the One Piece, though it's beautiful to have that self-restraint and to have that awe for adventure and to seek the answers out for yourself. So for as much as we could have gotten like the best lore dump, I'm so glad we kind of didn't. But of course, one of the big questions is where is this right-hand man of Gold Rogers. <laughs> well, this man has the worst gambling addiction I've ever seen, going really out of his way to try to get more money. But you see, everything was played fairly hypothetically. Every situation so far has been laced with this sort of PG, everything's gonna be okay energy. Even when Kami and Hachi were really in danger, none of them were really in danger. Bootleg Sanji wasn't that much of a threat, and he even turned into a charismatic, lighthearted, jokey character. And so it wasn't until the collar incident where we see just how real all of this is. Like Luffy gets off his bike, everybody bows down. We see everyone hesitant to act or look, followed up by seeing and understanding the consequences of confronting a world noble. And immediately it's like, okay, these are the stakes. This is the big picture. And it's rare, but I love when it happens. It's like one of the few situations in which like raw violence alone is not going to solve the issue because we know that if admirals were to show up, the squad would be dead. Like if Admiral Akiji was here and he didn't let the Straw Hats get away, we'd all be dead. Not to mention any other admirals coming from Marijua. All right, and then like Kami gets abducted. After the story has just shown them having fun in the theme park, like the theme park was an understanding that life as a mermaid, let alone any other resident of Fishman Island, was going to be a difficult life. And then things get like really dark, not just with Kami, but also everyone around her. We see everyone else trapped and imprisoned random strangers men women other pirates a giant and even silvers himself which did make me feel a little better. Roger's crew kind of makes me feel at ease here, even if like Silver is caught. Just his general vibe told me like, okay, at least he has a plan. And we see that he does. This man's got hockey. He's smug about it. He knows what he's doing, whatever crazy scheme he's up to. I mean, this man has essentially brought a cannon to a rubber band fight. And look, I say Silver's is insane, but the rest of the Straw Hats are even more crazy. 
And like, sure, all of the rookies are aware of the Straw Hats. The rookies have read the newspaper. They've read what happened in NS Lobby. And even though the rule is don't mess with the world nobles, Zoro almost cuts one down, which, you know, understandable. I think even if Zoro was aware of the consequences, he still would have done it. Bonnie stops him. And as she mentions, the Straw Hat pirates are just as crazy as everyone says they are. And that is when I realized that, yeah, to the outside world, these Straw Hats are insane. His debut was less than a year ago, probably with him taking down Arlong as well as some of the other pirates in East Blue. He then immediately traverses the Grand Line and heads straight towards one of the seven warlords of the sea and then takes him down. Okay, this guy is a little bit insane. What is he doing? He doesn't just stop there. He continues over into NS Lobby, destroys CP9, deals back a very wanted woman capable of activating an ancient weapon along with a man who can create that ancient weapon and then Ennis Lobby is absolutely destroyed. Like sure, the rookies are bad in their own ways, but they know that it is a suicide mission to attack Ennis Lobby. So for him to do that and then for him to come to Sabodi, a place right next to Marijua, but no, no, no. It doesn't just end there for Luffy, because right after, he crashes into the auction house, sees a world noble, and knocks him out. <laughs> yeah, of course everyone thinks the Straw Hats are insane. We as the audience have the context necessary to understand what Luffy is doing, and even though it might be extremely dangerous, it's at least comprehensible. But to the outside world, who doesn't know, Luffy is just a threat. Again, to us, the audience, we see how despicable the World Nobles are, as well as how everyone around the World Nobles tries to protect them. How Hachi, even after being shot, tries to protect everyone else, blaming himself for something that he had no control over, for something that should not be his fault, and that he should be furious at. Looking around, you see everyone here is just okay with the concept of the auction house. Everyone is betting they're happy, so completely disassociated from the world around them which is where we finally get to see this writing strategy that's been used all the way back since Arlong Park, I completely forgot about it, of building up this bad guy for as long as possible, just making you utterly despise this character, making you want somebody to hit him, and then you just see Luffy go in there and just... <laughs> And soon is where the Straw Hats will learn about consequences. Just because you can punch a guy doesn't mean you can disarm a bomb that's strapped to your neck. So it's interesting to see like Silvers go in there, step in, and just unlock Kami's chains. He's like super casual about it too. But it did start making me think about hockey. We just got introduced to it like an arc ago. And now Shanks can use hockey. Silvers can use hockey. Even Luffy can use hockey. Maybe Zoro. I don't know if this one counts or if he's just getting ran and pirates, but it's clearly not a devil fruit. And so immediately I'm like, okay, you have an ability that's unlike devil fruits that anyone can use seemingly anywhere. What is this ability that you have just thrown out there? What else can it do? You could already use it kind of like as a shockwave to knock people out. So can you use it to like launch objects or people? Oh, is that like partially what Kuma is doing along with his paw ability? Can hockey change people's moods besides them just passing out? Can it make them happier or sadder or angry or make them an ally? Can hockey be used to like uh, read people's minds? Can hockey be used to boo faster? Because silver is pretty fast too. Um... <laughs> I'm just guessing at this point. This is me throwing up more potential ideas that hockey could be used for. And for hockey, we have barely heard people talk about it and nobody has explained the concept yet. Anyways, <clears throat> punching the world noble <laughs> was utterly satisfying. After so much buildup, are you kidding me? Someone had to do it. There are going to be extremely bad consequences for doing this not once, but twice. In the context of the story, the Straw Hats are like the type of people who do something that nobody else is going to do. Because, of course, everybody knows that if you're trying to do this thing, you're gonna get yourself killed. Like, no matter how much you love a friend, you're not going into NS Lobby and trying to save them. Like, no matter how much you care about somebody, you know that you're not gonna do something as soon as they are abducted by the world nobles. It's a death sentence trying to stop them. The only difference here is that the Straw Hats 
that, knowing it's a death sentence, go forward anyways. And when Kizaru shows up riding a cannonball, which is an absolute power move, you did not need to do that. You move at the speed of light, so anything besides that is just flexing. When Kizaru shows up, the consequences are on. Also, a thing I noticed, stipulation time. I think all of the admirals are Logia types because it practically makes them invincible. You can't kill a Logia type. If you try to like crush out Kiji, he just reforms into ice. You try to kill Kizaru, he's just gonna reshape into light. Like maybe like, okay, like Luffy could maybe use his rubber powers against the Nehru. Ace could like probably maybe fight Okiji. And maybe, I don't know, Blackbeard can use his like devil fruit on Kizaru, but that's about it. Those are the only people who can defeat these other people. Throw a crocodile in there. He could probably fight one of those guys too, but that's it. I love that the only way to escape the auction house is by fighting more and more groups, which is a beautiful way to introduce these three captains and to see how their dynamics are going to look like. I don't know if we're going to be seeing the rest of the rookies, but with how much we've been hinting at the new world and how much we've been getting insight into these three characters' dynamics with them all thinking of themselves as big shots, along with seeing Kid also want the One Piece... I mean, I realized that the other rookies probably realized this was a suicide mission and just got out of there. Like, we got introduced to Kizaru, and we just saw how frightening he can be. I mean, just like in Nehru, if someone tries to assassinate you and you don't even feel anything, that's a sign that the people who tried are probably not going to win. Especially when Kuma comes in and you're trying to fight Kuma and halfway through you realize that's not the real Kuma. And it's so utterly difficult to even take the fake one down. And okay, I realize it would be kind of cool if every rookie kind of died here. Like imagine if we immediately enter Sabodi and we learn about all of these fascinating characters only to find out that all of them are going to die and not even against the real Kuma. That would be beautiful. Oda wouldn't do that though. One Piece as like an epic kind of likes to stretch out all the drama that it can get out of a scene. But almost nobody dies quickly ever in One Piece. But with Kuma, I realized that one of my main guesses over in Thriller Bark was completely inaccurate. Just like forget everything that happened during that section if you watched it. Okay, in Thriller Bark, Moria is a reflection of what could happen to Luffy if he were to lose his entire crew. And since the Straw Hats beat Moria, I was kind of wondering what makes Luffy different from Moria. Like what would make Luffy jump over that ceiling that stops every ambitious pirate that even Moria couldn't jump over. The answer? Nothing. You fool. I was an absolute buffoon. Sure, the Straw Hats were like absolutely destroyed by Kuma. Don't get me wrong. We'll talk about that in a second. But I realized that the Straw Hats' downfall was not in Sabote. There wasn't a question of how Luffy was going to surpass the ceiling because Luffy had already hit the ceiling. The Straw Hats were not going to die in Sabote because the Straw Hats had already died in Thriller Bark. The second Kuma entered Thriller Bark, the crew should have been dead. Bartholomew Kuma is to Luffy what Kaido was to Moria. If Kuma chose not to spare the crew's life that day, everybody in Thriller Bark would have been dead. Here's what I think about the Straw Hats in the ceiling. Throughout this whole adventure, the crew has never stopped pushing against the ceiling. When the Straw Hats were up against the pirate crew, they could handle it. When it's like a smaller organization, the crew might be able to handle it. But more and more, the crew has been facing bigger and bigger opponents until thematically and literally, the Straw Hats were challenging the world. The Straw Hats are choosing to address a problem that nobody else will and in turn face the consequences. And so we see the Straw Hats try to deal with the consequences. Good thing they weren't also fighting Kizaru. But even the fake Kuma was too much for the Straw Hats. And I didn't even mention this before, but here's where I will gladly give some of the anime its praise. When Luffy punches a world noble, we got this one very dramatic stylized effect. And now, with Kuma destroying the Straw Hats, there is a desperation that comes over the crew as they realize that they are utterly screwed. Everybody is tired and there's no way you're going to be able to stall for three days. You might not even last the next hour. 
And when Kuma makes one of the straw hats disappear, there is this thematically beautiful moment in the anime that doesn't occur in the manga of the bubbles of Sabodia floating to the top, hitting the ceiling and popping. As Kuma goes around making every single straw hat disappear, their subsequent bubbles pop. Your hopes, your ambitions, your dreams pop. Because you have hit the ceiling. Here's where Luffy isn't just panicking. He's like full on desperate, bawling for Kuma to stop. Until again, only in the anime, there is a single bubble that remains. And again, praising the anime, once Luffy is the only one standing, he utterly breaks down. In the anime, you can see him like writhing in pain. He isn't just like kneeling over. There is a a ton of emotions that are bursting out here in a fit of desperation. This is where Luffy learns that you cannot just simply challenge authority without strength. When the Straw Hats are running away, they're not just running away because everyone else can handle it for them. The Straw Hats are running away because at their core, even with them using their peak abilities, the crew was too weak. And just like in Thriller Bark, they should have been dead right here. Just like in Thriller Bark, the only reason the Straw Hats lived is because Kuma spared them. Here in this moment, the only difference between Moria and Luffy is that Luffy got lucky. And then everybody dies. Okay, that's not true. But if there was ever a time in which the Straw Hats die... It would be here. This is it. They're gone. 